Warning, this video covers topics such as depression, unaliving oneself, and mental health disorders. The views expressed in this video are of my own and should not be taken as medical advice. If you or someone you know is suffering or in crisis, please contact a medical professional or text 988 to speak with someone. I want to talk about the medication part first, because um, I'm a naturalist, um, and I believe our ancestors and stuff, they went through things, and it was natural remedies and stuff to heal things that we were going through. Yeah, I think, I think it's hard for black men especially to talk about depression, because we have so many cool words available to us to undermine how we really feel, you know? <laughs> Like a couple of years ago, I was having some suicidal thoughts and depression. So I checked myself into a psych unit. And um, I know you guys are looking at me like Jordan, but you're so handsome <laughs> and well put together. But you know what they say, black don't crack, only psychologically. <laughs> I got out of the psych unit and a friend of mine was like, are you okay, man? Is everything all right? But I had so many cool words available to me. I was like, yeah, I was just tripping. <laughs> and I was honest. Being on antidepressants feels like your brain is being gentrified. That's what it feels like. It really does. It's like the property value has gone up, but I don't recognize this place. Like... Fucking example. They supposed to be putting medicine in America to help motherfuckers feel better and help you live better. But these motherfuckers don't give a fuck about the medicine. They out making their motherfucking money. They give you one medication supposed to fix some shit and the side effect fuck up your leg and shit. Then they give you another one to fix that, and it fuck up your arm, and now you on two medications looking like a flamingo in front of your motherfucking children and shit. These motherfuckers don't give a fuck. Hi, Trap Tribe. It's me, me, Ashley of Trap Pray Love, and I take medication for my anxiety and behavior that is consistent with bipolar disorder. Although I feel like a little upset with myself that I didn't get um, medication sooner, I find myself not liking hospitals and not knowing if I can 100% trust hospitals. Because I think it is because of that um, trope that we've all seen since childhood, where there is this person that everyone thinks that he's crazy and they're not really crazy. And then they take them off to a mental institution. And when the person is like, no, this is really going on. I'm not crazy. I swear this is really happening. There's always like a nurse that's like, oh no, they're there, take your medication. And mind you, like that trope was the only thing that I saw <laughs> about like people struggling with mental health disorders outside of like, you know, the person laying on the couch and talking to a therapist. So like, honestly, I think seeing images like that when I was really young paired with like other social stigma of like really struggling with mental health issues is part of the reason why you know, I kind of kept quiet about a lot of the things that I was dealing with. When I was a kid, I always intensely felt emotions and I thought that was normal. Like um, some people could see like a commercial or like a sad part in a kid's show and like kind of start tearing up. I would be boohoo crying and that would like really affect me. <laughs> or the same thing, like when I felt happy, I felt really happy. And when I felt like miserable, I felt really miserable. So I dealt with life on a lot of extremes, like when it came to emotions. I always thought like bipolar disorder was kind of like mul multiple personality disorder, where it's like one minute you're this way and the next minute you're this way. I guess it is for some people, but for me, I didn't think that I was bipolar <laughs> because I was just like, feeling things deeply. And my parents just thought that like, you're not trying hard enough, nigga. I didn't realize that it was like some things that were going on in school would really affect my ability to focus and concentrate, which is like kind of normal. But when it's to the point where you're like an A student now making straight C's and you're not even interested in like a lot of the favorite things that you like, that's when it's like, okay, we need to dig deeper. But my parents were just like, no nigga, you need to study. Ain't shit wrong with you, <laughs> you know? What I would like to say though, is before I actually ended up getting help for myself and getting medication, when I was in college, like as I moved into adulthood, I hung out with all of like, the edgy um, black kids that were like artists, you know, the dangly earring type skateboarding niggas, right? And a lot of them were very like naturalist and spiritual. And they would always say like, bro, don't trust these hospitals. Like, you know, you just need to smoke a J. You're just not drinking enough alkaline water. You need to meditate and like get close to Buddha and all this other shit. And I mean, like I was doing all those things and I was feeling a little better, but at the same time, like it wasn't fully helping. <laughs> You know, and so I started feeling guilty and feeling like, oh damn, what's wrong with me? Maybe I'm not trying enough. I have to admit, I'm one of those people that didn't 100% believe in like panic attacks. Like I would see like girls have panic attacks around me in college and shit. And I would be thinking like, this bitch is faking. But it wasn't until like 
I started realizing that I were, was having panic attacks a lot where I started understanding like this shit is real and this shit is something that like meditation probably is not going to fix because it's something going on like with my brain. And for those of you that don't know what a panic attack like feels like, well, I don't want to speak for everyone, but for me, have you ever like been in a car and then you almost like someone almost hits you, you like get out of the way of an accident and you feel like your stomach is like jumps into your throat? That is what it feels like to have a panic attack, but it's not like for like that split second and you calm yourself down. You feel like that, like your body and the adrenaline for like hours on end. And when your body is all tense and crazy like that, it is very <laughs> insane <laughs> to go through. I, um, I don't wanna take up too much time talking about my own personal experiences with the shit. If you're more interested in that, I'm gonna link a video where I talk about that more, an older video that I posted. But um, it wasn't until like one morning I was going into work and all of a sudden I had a panic attack and um, I literally, um, a thought just came into my head and I was like, um, you need to go talk to somebody. You need to get on some medication. You tried meditation, you tried shoving crystals up your ass, you fixed your diet, you tried being grateful and um, present in the moment and whatever the fuck like niggas is talking about nowadays. But the one thing you haven't tried is medication. And when I did start the medication, it was a little rough at first, but like after about a month or so in, I started feeling my, like myself again and I stopped having panic attacks. And along with all the other things that I was doing, I've started like seeing my mood and my life improve. So um, long story short, medication has helped me. Um, in this video, we're going to talk about medication and the black community why we're apprehensive about it. We're gonna talk about the brain. We're gonna talk about SSRIs. And we're also gonna talk about racism and the racist history that got us here. So if this is something that you're interested in, um, keep watching. So before we talk about why African-Americans are less likely to seek out medication as an option for mental health disorders, I wanna talk about the numbers um, of mental health and what is going on in our community. According to a 2018 study that was published in Preventive Medicine, it has shown that black and brown people are more likely to battle with depression more than whites. The reason for this was unhealthy habits such as cigarette smoking, little exercise, poor diet, and chronic stress. You know, poor nigga shit. The study showed that social and economic disparities are an important factor in depression. Basically, if you live in poverty, you have less access to education, healthy diet, and proper health care, and you are more prone to living in violent crime riddled areas. So it's no surprise that the most common mental illnesses that African Americans are prone to are bipolar disorder, PTSD, and depression. But what does that exactly look like um, on your brain? When you are exposed to severe and chronic stress, like people experience when they have depression, you lose some of the connections between the nerve cells. And the communication in these circuits becomes inefficient and noisy. Because of the noisy communication, in the circuits involved in regulating mood and emotion, we think that the loss of these synaptic connections contributes to the biology of depression. So how can exactly does the medication work if you're prescribed a medication? Um, if you're dealing with um, high anxiety, OCD, depression, um, things like that, you're gonna be most likely prescribed a medication called an SSRI. But how exactly do SSRIs work with treating depression um, in the brain? SSRIs were developed in the 1970s with the goal of treating depression by increasing serotonin levels. This goal was formulated based on the serotonin hypothesis of depression, which suggests that depression is caused by low levels of the neurotransmitter serotonin. SSRIs work by inhibiting a mechanism called reuptake. In reuptake, a protein called a transporter transports excess neurotransmitter molecules out of the synaptic cleft usually back into the neuron that released them. SSRIs inhibit the reuptake of serotonin. By inhibiting the removal of serotonin from the synaptic cleft, this causes levels of serotonin in the synaptic cleft to rise. These increases in serotonin levels have been hypothesized to be the mechanism by which SSRIs can treat the symptoms of depression. 
Now I want to make sure that my point is crystal clear in this video that this is not a video that is pushing medication on anyone in any community. In my opinion um, and with the empirical evidence it has shown medication with other um, lifestyle changes that is the most effective way to long-term treating mental illnesses. But the question is why are black people less likely to receive medication as treatment? Well, for that, we have to look back in history. So we all know that medicine and scientific discovery has come a long way, but I don't think that a lot of people really understand how long of a way it has come. Um, back in the day, no one really understood a lot about our body and let alone mental illnesses. For instance, did you know that we've only been using soap to stop the spread of germs for about 150 years? In fact, two thirds of the deaths of the American Civil War were not caused by the actual injuries themselves, but by the spread of infection from the injuries. And let's not even talk about like mental health. Like for instance, if a woman in like the 20s was like, uh, I don't know, I don't feel like washing dishes today. Maybe I wanna go out and vote and get a job. No bullshit, her husband would be like, hey doctor, this bitch has hysteria. And they would lock her up in like a uh, American Horror Story type asylum and give her shock treatment for the rest of her fucking life. And she would come back as a vegetable and they'd be like, she's cured, she's washing dishes again. Like, you know, it's not a trap pray love video until I give you like a did you know type shit about like history. So here's like a little did you know fact about like mental health history and like women. So um, I'm reading from my laptop really quickly, but did you know that the eldest Kennedy daughter, Rosemary, was like an independent woman, bad bitch, if you will. Like she partied, had lovers, had a wild ass lifestyle that was different from her siblings. So her family like tried to take action because they were like, bro, this ain't the Kennedy way. She's out here tripping. So they decided to lobotomize her. Like they no bullshit, cut her head open, poked around in her brain and the lobotomy failed. So she ended up losing the ability to walk. She couldn't talk. She was basically like a fucking vegetable. Her personality changed for the rest of her life and the family just institutionalized her. So like back in the day, because people didn't really know what the fuck they were doing, like niggas were just like experimenting on people. And this is where the video gets a little deep. Back in the day when black people were seen as less than people, who do you think they were experimenting on? In 1808, the act to prohibit the import of slaves were passed and it made it illegal for new slaves to be brought to America. However, the slave population continued to boom, not because of new slaves being brought to America, but because now slave owners were beginning to breed their own slaves, much like animals on a farm. So before this law was passed, doctors really didn't give a fuck about practicing obstetrics. Um, they saw it as like time consuming and modest. And so um, the only assistance that women had at the time of childbirth was through a midwife. Like having a midwife is better than nothing. However, we have to remember that back in the day, a midwife's experience was what gave her the knowledge to help deliver a baby and not necessarily scientific evidence or anything like that. So back in the day, um, the, the maternal mortality rate was at 12%. So that meant that 12% of all women that were expecting were not gonna live after um, they gave birth. So this was a huge fucking problem. But after the law was passed that, hey, you can't bring any more slaves. And now people are like, boy, our crops are booming. We still need more slaves. Okay, now let's start investing into how to make sure that we're having as many kids born healthily to work these motherfucking crops. So slave masters and everyone now wanted to pat a practice obstetrics. So this led to slave women being experimented on. J. Marion Sims, also celebrated for being the father of modern gynecology, was a surgeon who made many scientific breakthroughs by the unethical experimentation on slaves. Many women at the time suffered from a condition called VVF, or vesticovaginal fistula. This is a complication of childbirth where a hole develops and leads to constant incontinence, or people being unable to control their bladder. This condition also prevented slave women from performing hard labor and it affected their, their ability to have future children. J. Marion Sims figured out how to surgically treat women with VVF after performing experimental surgeries on slave women with the condition that lived on his property. One woman, a slave woman named Anarka, went through as many as 30 surgeries. 
here is another thing that the medical society believed back in the day. They believed that black people didn't experience pain the same way that white people did. So when J. Marion Sims was doing all of these experiments and all this other shit, he was not giving black women any painkillers. But when he was doing the operations on like white women, they were usually given things for the pain. And another thing that I wanna throw in here, going to the doctor back in the day, um, if you couldn't afford it, you didn't go to the doctor. <laughs> it wasn't out of the ordinary for slaves to just not receive medical treatment. Um, and this led to a lot of the mindset of, God will heal you, give your issues up to God and pray it away and things like that. And that is an issue that we are still dealing with in our community to this day, that God and Jesus are the ultimate healers and that you don't need to do A, B, C, and D. So that's a little bit of the mindset that we have today when it comes to the medical industry, when it comes to black people. Speaking of mindsets that we are still dealing with today, a 2016 survey found that about half of all white medical students believe false differences between black and white patients. 25% of these students believe that black people have thicker skin than whites. The persistence of racist medical beliefs not only prevent African Americans from getting good care when they visit the doctor, but it also perpetuates the distrust that African Americans have when it comes to medicine. It is no secret that historically black people have been experimented on. So y'all remember when that Schmovid vaccine first came out? Niggas was like, Shit. the most popular known um, example for when African Americans were tested on were the Tuskegee experiments. According to the CDC website, the U.S. Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee was a study conducted between 1932 and 1972. The study was intended to observe the natural history of untreated syphilis. As part of the study, researchers did not collect the informed consent from participants. They did not offer treatment even after it was wild, widely available. The study ended in 1972 on the recommendation of an ad hoc advisory panel covened by the Assistant Secretary for Health and Scientific Affairs following the publication of news articles about the study. In 1997, President Clinton issued a formal presidential apology in which he announced an investment to establish what would become the National Center for Bioethics in Research and Healthcare of Tuskegee University. So in other words, for 30 years, the US government was infecting niggas with syphilis. They were infecting black people with syphilis, not giving them treatment, and we're going to keep doing it until journalists broke the news and people started filing lawsuits about what the fuck was going on. Is it hard to believe that when Kanye said, if I was on medication right now, then one pill could have been swapped out and it would be Michael Jackson and Prince all over again and people believed it. Like, would it be hard to believe? Like, because shit like that has happened. And don't get me wrong, I'm not defending the, demon the demonization of medication in our community. However, there have <laughs> been times where the conspiracies have been true. And this is part of the reason why black people are less likely to trust some of the new shit that is coming out, being able to trust hospitals, being able to trust white people with a lab coat on and shit. Like this is just true shit and it's an issue that we need to start talking about and needing to attack at the root of the problem. So where do we go from here? We definitely need more black and brown people in the healthcare profession. Um, according to a 2018 study, it showed that only 5% of all active physicians in the US are black. And honestly, getting more black people into the healthcare pipeline is a whole other video because it talks about the MCAT, it talks about racism, it talks about affirmative action, and just a lot of the blocks that are systematically put in place. <laughs> but uh, we definitely need more black and brown people in that industry because I believe 100% if I went to a black fucking doctor, they wouldn't be roughhousing me and stabbing me and poking me all rough with the belief that my skin is thicker than a white person. The other thing that we need to do is make healthcare completely free. I'm not saying expanding Medicare. I'm not saying Obamacare. I'm saying healthcare needs to be free fucking period. Fuck capitalism. And the other thing I think that we should immediately start doing is 
double check the advice that you're getting about medication. Um, I'm not saying that medication should be pushed on everyone, but I'm saying if you're trying all of the other things like me, if you're doing all of the other things and you haven't tried medication, don't completely knock it. Um, because if your ass is like a menace to society, you can't be out here fucking shit up. You need to get the help that you need. <laughs> So, okay guys, that is what I have for you. I'm gonna leave it there. Make sure you like, share, comment, and subscribe. If you want me to make a part two to this video, uh, make sure you let me know in the comments. Also, um, subscribe to my Instagram. That will help me fund a lot of the crazy shit that I'm doing on here as well. But thank you again for being part of the Trap Tribe. Bye.